everyone be here. Always love speaking to my church family here. If you have your Bible, we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. You can use a pew Bible in front of you. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to just jump right into it. When we look at basically human history from a, a purely secular lens, there are these two institutions that just seem to pop up out of nowhere and somehow withstand the test of time. No matter how much, you know, how badly humans fail them, they just seem to continue to exist, and that is the church and marriage. And they didn't just, they didn't just naturally evolve as one would expect through natural selection. They came about, and they brought benefits to the people who participated in them. In fact, they brought benefits to society at large. Observing this phenomenon as believers in Christ, reading God's word, we can confidently say that, we, that God gave this as a gift to man. Even further than that, they're meant to complement one another. They're meant to help us understand. Marriage was given by God so that we could better understand his church and the union between God and his people. I hope your week went really well. I know my week was crazy busy. I was very blessed to officiate Taven and Warren's wedding and then turn right around and give a Bible study for the uh, the young parents. And so my brain has been 90% marriage when it came to putting this lesson together. And just thinking about the new year, we should be thinking about marriage. It's a good thing to think about marriage, especially as we're thinking about restartings and hobbies and habits and commitments. It's nice to rethink the commitments that we've made to our spouse, that our better half, that person that we are living with every day. We should want to go into the new year working to strengthen that relationship and that commitment with each other. And I'm not leaving the single people out, the non-married people out. Any application that we make today can be made in our commitments and our relationships just at a different level, whether coworker, friend, husband, wife, even our relationship to God as well. But we want to go in the new year again with stronger relationships and commitments. If we're going to have a chance of growing in our faith, we need relationships. We need them. Relationships that we're commanded to show love in, relationships that we have vowed to you know, be with these people and to show love in as well. As we begin and we start this lesson, I want us to look at the slide here and be reminded of a message that marriage is good, that it's good. And that's a healthy reminder when we live in a culture full of ideologies and academics that tell us the opposite, that marriage is bad. In fact, To many, marriage is viewed as this prison. Marriage only benefits men and and uses women. Marriage is a social construct that deserves to be deconstructed and thrown away because it's outdated and it's useless. They'll even say that marriage just puts stipulations on love. And if I'm going to love someone in that way, I don't need to make a commitment to them. But what we'll find is that type of thinking gets us in trouble in the long run. However, in the midst of all those negative messages, it's easy to look inside and wonder, what did I do wrong? Did I do something wrong here? Did I make the wrong decision? Did I get married at the wrong time? And so on. But it's easy when we think of marriage to just go right to the negative. Because we've all witnessed those marriages, hundreds of marriages, where we've seen you know, mistakes and accidents and failures, and that's all we can think of. But what we'll see is those exist not so much because of those vows. They don't exist because of those vows, but the evil in this world. Because the fact is, us as humans, we have the ability to just mess up the best of intentions, and that includes marriage, including the relationships to others. But God's message, it still remains a light, a beacon of hope that marriage is good, and that's what we'll see from his word And that's the message, that marriage is good. Hopefully we'll look at old passages, but still look at them at a different light. So commitments to people, to friendships, those things, they're good. And so is marriage. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 and the message that's being taught here, because it contradicts what the culture is preaching and teaching. But, but, it is the inevitable solution to the problems that we see today. It is. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 22. 
where it tells us, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and he himself, its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Every time we look at this passage, or we talk about this passage, we, the, we look at that blaring word that is screaming at us through those, through those pages and those verses. In verses 22 and 24, that word submit, because it's just going against what maybe our friends told us or the culture told us. And yet Sam brought us a great class this morning on how we should submit to God. There are, in the English language, words that have negative and positive connotations to them. But that doesn't mean that they have to always be negative application. You look at society again. I want us to look at society and what it's influenced by in our culture. It's strongly influenced by the feminist liberation movement. And in the 19th century and even into the early 20th century, it had its place. But what you'll notice, it's not about rights anymore. It's just all about sex. You can sleep with whoever you want, whenever you want, and it's your body, your choice, and it's your freedom. And that, that sounds like an enticing message if all we're thinking about is the flesh and the things of this world and not the things of above, not the things of God. The sexual revolution did not free women as it was expected to do, as they thought it would do, nor did it make men in our culture better. It did the opposite. It did the complete opposite. Instead, what we saw were the Hugh Hefners and the Jeffrey Epsteins and the Harvey Weinsteins rule the 20th and early 21st century to this day. And listen to this, under the banner of consent. That is what a society without marriage looks like. People hurt, abused, lied to, and suppressing true feelings when engaging in meaningless intimacy. Remember, when we look at what we're talking about this evening, we're looking at generalizations, what we normally would see, the normal pattern. I'm not saying that marriage is free of abuse, but marriage is uniquely the only thing that can counteract the effects of this revolution because marriage isn't only about sex. It's not just about ourselves. It's not self-seeking as God designed it to be. It's to find companionship and then use that companionship to then glorify God. And so marriage is unique in that way because God designed it from the very beginning in that way. When he brought Adam and Eve together, because why? Because Adam was there. He was lonely, and it's not good for man to be alone. But what we find when we read God's word in passages like these, and in Ephesians chapter 5, is that marriage actually frees women. It protects them from men who use them, men who want to take advantage of them, men who want to take advantage of the lies our culture feeds us and the revolution that we see, the sexual revolution, to be whoever and whatever they want to be. And so marriage, it protects us. It protects us and creates this safety net for men and women, but especially women. And the same goes for our relationship for God. Having a relationship with God it protects us. Read that passage again in verse 24. What does it say about Jesus? Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. When we submit to Christ, we are protected. Does that mean that as Christians that we'll never experience physical harm? No, but it does mean that our salvation won't go away, that's protected, that we won't lose our hope that we have in Jesus unless we choose to leave that covenant, unless we choose to break that commitment that we made. But submitting to Christ makes all the difference in our life. It makes all the difference in the choices that we make and the actions that we take. And so if you're in Ephesians 5, look at the beginning of this book, in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and look at how Paul starts this letter talking about God's people and how God's people are his possession, starting in verse 7. It says, in him, verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. There's that idea of salvation. 
which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery, remember that word mystery, of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have ordained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things together according to the counsel of his will. Verse 8, look at that verse again and notice, what is this all for? What is this all for? Making known the mystery of God's will according to God's purpose. It is for God's purpose. He sets in stones the institutions that are going to last. He does what he wants and what he wills. And so God's purpose is according to his pleasure. Seeing us follow him, enter into a covenant with him, fall into his protection, into his destiny, it all pleases him. And yet what does God do for us? He loves us. He protects us. Verse 11, he ordains an inheritance. And in short, because of that inheritance, we are his possession. As the church, saints, brothers and sisters that belong to Christ, when we read God's word, when we sing hymns to each other, we can say, as, it's in his, as it is in his, in his word, that Jesus is ours, that he is ours. As a church, he is our king, we are his bride, he is our savior, our redeemer, he is our God. We are his and he is ours and that is a relationship. And our marriage between our spouses is supposed to mimic that, that idea of submission, that submission that is our protection. Does that mean that God dominates us and uses us and forces us to, to love him? No, we can, we're free to leave that covenant, but that is only because as humans, we have a reputation of breaking covenants and oaths and vows. But the thing is, God never breaks his covenant. He's always there. He won't leave. And yet he says in Malachi chapter 2 that God hates divorce. He hates it. He hates when a, a man and a woman decide to live their life together and make that oath and then later on change their mind. He hates that. He hates it when those are his treasured possession. Those people decide to just leave him. God hates pride. He hates self-reliance, self-obsession, self-loathing, self-ambition, these things. And yet, through Christ, God protects us from the conclusions and the condemnation that pride brings to our soul. And so we go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Look at the, verse, the first part of that chapter. Verses 3 through 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, God warns against this evil that might sneak into the church and corrupt our relationship with him. In verse 3, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, no foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead... Let there be thanksgiving, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Notice how all of those things pertain to sex. And yet what we read in the verses right above it, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, what does it say? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So before he lists the impurities and the meaningless you know, pros, promis, uh, promiscuity, prom, <laughs> promiscuity, excuse me, what does God tell us? God tells us to live in love. God tells us to walk in love at the very beginning of that message. And instead of telling us, yeah, walk in love and then live you know, sexually free and fluid. He says, no, in order to enter into the kingdom of Christ and God, you need to be sexually pure, it says there. These same principles are going to be applied to our relationship with God, 
but they should easily be applied to our relationship with our spouse as well. And yet the culture says, no, that freedom is what, how we express our love. And yet it isn't freeing the men or women, especially women. In fact, what it does is it creates a system of sin that just empowers and benefits men who take advantage of women. I find it ironic that we live in a culture that tells us, it tells us these empty words and says to women, you want to be a feminist. You want to be free from the constraints of men. Then sleep around like men with everyone or whoever you want. And yet, to a man who is not faithfully following Christ, who's living in the world, that is exactly what he wants to hear women say. Mission accomplished. Right? You've been duped if you believe that lie, that somehow it's okay to have meaningless sex with men. And yet what we read in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, wives submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ, that is truly feminist. He said, looking after the well-being of women in general, it's saying enter into a loving relationship where you're not taken advantage of. Whereas we see in these verses where God is telling us marriage is good, and yet it keeps on preaching in Ephesians chapter 5, this message of love and truth. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, leaving, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, and he who loves his wife loves himself. Now, notice the attention shifts, where it was focusing mainly on the women. Now we're shifting, we're focusing mainly on the men. We're now men through marriage. You're called to love your wife. Well, what do we know about love? We know that it doesn't come about through meaningless intimacy. It doesn't happen. Love calls us to a higher standard, a higher standard than we normally would be without God just living for ourselves and living for our own pleasures. And now, men have to respect women, not treat them as property, to love their wife, never to abuse, but to love, never to take advantage of, but to love, to love them. What we don't realize is back in the day when this is being preached in the first century to the Romans and to the Greeks, this message is huge. It changes everything. It would not be uncommon for at least a wealthy Greek and Roman person to have well, a wife to carry on the legacy and the name, a mistress to, you know, please him at his convenience, and then, of course, slaves at his beck and call, all to please this loveless man. And yet, on average, women don't have this problem of not loving others. Women are just better, in fact, at just finding meaning where men can't find meaning. They don't usually have the problem of, detaching love from intimate moments. And that's why Paul's telling men, love your wives as you care for yourselves. Even further than that, much, much more important than that, raise the standard, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And how did Jesus love the church? He gave himself up for it. He sacrificed himself for it. Verse 25 again, we simply read, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And what? And gave himself up for her. Love is what made, it's one of the things that made Jesus' sacrifice so meaningful. Not just that he was divine and that he was God, but his sacrifice came out of love. And if it didn't come out of love, then verse 26 the purpose here of saving us wouldn't have been fulfilled of cleansing and sanctifying the church, God's people. And what we're quoting here, or alluding to, is 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. that tells us, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Angels, that idea of divinity there. Verse 2, and if I have prophetic powers spiritual powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge just like God has all knowledge and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains 
but have not love, I am nothing. And if I give all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, there's the idea of sacrifice, but have not love, I gain nothing. Salvation is not gained through sacrifice. Salvation is gained through sacrificial love. And God is love as we read in 1 John 4, 8. And when he calls us to love, God calls us to be better, better than our instincts, stronger than our peers, better than what the culture demands of us. And that is what love does. If we truly practice it the way God wants it and designs it, then we will be better humans. Then we will be better men and women for God. When God says, love your wife, he's commanding husbands to be better than who they were. And instituting marriage was not just a way to protect men and women, especially women, but it was a way for men and women to grow, to be better, especially men. It takes basically a loving covenant like marriage often to push and to motivate men to be better. I'm not saying that single men aren't as good as married men, but what I am saying is that marriage is a way, an institution that makes men better individually than who they were if they truly love their wife like Christ loved the church. We know that this concept obviously trickles down into other relationships as well. Just observing humans, we know that it's better to have friendships than to be alone. That even our friendships can influence us and make us better if we surround ourselves with the right company. But look at verse 27. Why did Jesus practice the sacrificial love? Why did he show love to the church? Notice this idea of becoming better so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that we might be holy and without blemish. So as faithful followers, we might become holy. We might be better than who we were without Christ. And what is, and what is our marriage supposed to do? It's supposed to mimic that idea. We love our wives and our wives love our husbands so that we can be presented as men and women who are compatible for a lifelong commitment. You see, marriage provides an incentive. Marriage encourages men in order to be attractive. You've got to be marriage material. Marriage raises the standard for men living in society. The standard that God knew out of love men needed in order to be better. At the same time, as a consequence, marriage, as we see in the Bible, allows women to be a little more picky, a little more choosy, to ask the question, and it should be a question every woman asks before they get married, are they going to love me as Christ loved the church? And this is why marriage has remained an institution throughout the test of time. And that's why God will continue to allow it to remain when, because people, even when people out of their, their selfish joy today declare that it's dead, it still will remain because society cannot last, it cannot progress without biblical monogamous marriage. Even further, God had the wisdom to know that marriage is what we often needed in order to be who God knows we can be. And if not marriage, then relationships. So we start the new year off with renewed commitments. Asking yourself, do you love your spouse like Christ loved the church? For both men and women, ask yourself that. Especially men, listen to this one. When you are alone, do you love your wife as Christ loved the church? When you're speaking to them, to your spouse, do you love them as Christ loved the church? When you're with them, do you love them as Christ loved the church? To put emphasis on this idea, the writer in Ecclesiastes expresses this wisdom in Ecclesiastes 9, verses 9 and 10. Speaking to men, but it can be applied to women as well. I love that first line. Enjoy life with your beloved wife during all the days of your fleeting life that God has given you on earth during all your fleeting days, for that is your reward in life and and in your burdensome work on earth. Just repeat that again. Enjoy life with your wife. Or enjoy life with your husband. What is it telling us? It's 
telling us that marriage is good. It's good. It's meant to be enjoyed. It's meant to be good. It's meant to be a way for humans to progress and to be better. Marriage helps us even furthermore understand our relationship to God as well. And that second verse there in verse 10, that's application for everyone, married or not married. I should underline it if you don't have an underline. It was encouraging to me throughout the week that whatever you find to do with your hands, it says do it. Do it with all your might because there is neither work nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom in the grave the place where you will eventually go. It's a sobering thought that yes, this life will end, but it doesn't have to be a bad journey. The great thing about the church is that we are surrounded by people who don't have to fear death. We can truly live our life, and whatever we do, we do to the best of our ability. As it says there, with all of our might, and that includes our relationships as well, our commitments that we make and our marriage. Commit yourself to your spouse with all of your might. And I know marriage doesn't work for everyone. I know there are horror stories, but what I'm talking about is through God's word, what we generally see, what we're supposed to see when applying what God has designed for us. Marriage is good. Now, I want us to understand something. Marriage, though, is not our Savior. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Let's finish that chapter, verses 32 to 33, where we read this passage where it says this mystery is great. What is this mystery? But I'm actually speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each one of you must also love his own wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. In the end, Jesus is our Savior. And the church is unique in that it is for everyone who accepts salvation for Christ. That includes married, widowed, divorced, young, old, single, hurt, broken, joyful, all. The church, the body of Christ, what Jesus is the head of, is a place where, just like marriage, we can find protection. We can find protection from temptation and sin and evil. And just like marriage, it should be, it should be a place of love. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, not a member of his church, you can be baptized tonight for the forgiveness of your sins, to be sanctified and made clean and to walk new and enter into a relationship with God and also a family of believers. If that is you this evening, then come forward now while we stand and we sing.